I'm always reading the terrain and going, hey, there's a massive climb coming up. And what gear I choose to enter that climb, what gear that I choose um, to sustain that climb, right? There's a lot of mental energy going in and being very intentional. Because if you get in the wrong gear, at the wrong climb, at the wrong elevation, I'm just telling you, I've hit an elevation, hmm. I got it wrong, and I was in too big a gear, and I'm I'm dying on the hill. Yeah. And trying to change into a lower gear when the elevation is at 10, 11, 12%, I mean, it's, it's, you can do it. But it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. And the same thing going downhill, right? You're like, you're always. And I think that's the goal when it comes to, it's not balance, it's rhythm. It's going to, hey, I know that throughout my leadership life, I have to be adjusting my rhythm, especially when it comes to emotional health, mm-hmm. to realize that there's just times where I can crank into a higher gear. There's times I must intentionally intentionally force myself into a lower gear yeah so i can focus on 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 me fill back up and i know what's coming my way and i'm going to crank back into a gear welcome to the advancing leader podcast where we equip leaders to accelerate the mission of the church we have an awesome episode today chris i'm super excited Uh, It's a timely one. It's just one of those conversations that I think needs to be talked about no matter what context of leadership you're in. It's just this, um, how are your your emotions in leadership? What's your emotional health like in leadership? And so again, this is a timely conversation and it's a critical one uh, because we always need to be evaluating ourselves, how we're doing uh, emotionally, and then just like how we're doing in a difficult season. I think we've been in a difficult season. Yeah. So it's important that we're that we're taking a look at that. So um, yeah, before we jump into the conversation, I actually have been having a really great conversation with my leaders in Dubois, kind of on something similar. It was our physical health, our emotional health, our, our spiritual health, and just how we can be better leaders and how we can incorporate those things into how we lead. So it's kind of awesome that we're talking about it here um, as well, you know, on the podcast. So why don't we jump in to our conversation? Yeah, you know, I think so many times when people think leadership, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one, but there's just this whole image like the leader's the one uh, charging up the hill, the leader's the one who's like, hey, come follow me, the leader's the one that's, you know, um, uh, leading out in front, which is an image, but so many times leaders don't pause to go, well, yeah, but there's there's so much more to leadership than just charging up the hill, yeah. right? There's so much that happens in the lives of the people you're leading. And uh, and that's why this conversation about the emotional health of a leader, I think is so important because ultimately a leader is pouring himself, herself out into the team they lead. I mean, that's really what leadership is about. Mm. It's like, how can I empty myself into the people? How can I encourage them? How can I guide them? How can I equip them? How can I come beside them? How can I empty myself into my team? And uh, what can so easily happen is a leader spends all of their time emptying themselves into their team that all of a sudden one day they wake up and there's no more within them to empty out. Oh, yeah. And that becomes the issue. And then you see leaders burn out. You, get, you see leaders intentionally or unintentionally make decisions that disqualify them from leadership or make decisions where people go, I don't want to follow that person because, well, I just now know who they are. Mm. And uh, I think sometimes leaders make those decisions just because they're so hollow and empty inside. They're trying to figure a way to self-select out. And ultimately, we want to be leaders. You know, you and I want to be leaders that will lead for the long game. Yeah. And we want to be on teams with people that, well, they lead the long game, not just for now, not for the immediate future. But, well, one day I want to sit down, look at my wife and say, hey, you know, we have led well together. We have given all we can. And then, you know, take my last breath and go to heaven. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, to say, hey, we we, we not le- led perfectly, not got it all right all the time, but we led out of an overflow of our lives, not from, you know, a desert place or an empty place. And I think there's so many leaders leading from empty, and they they might not even realize it, yeah. that they're leading from 
empty. Yeah, I think that's why it's so important to have this check-in. Yeah. To evaluate what are you really feeling? What are you really processing? What are you really navigating? Because you're right. I think it's so easy for us to get caught up in the task, to get caught up in the next you know, goal, to get, taught up in, get caught up in the mission, to get caught up in what we're doing currently, that we just can completely gloss over what's going on internally within us. Yeah. And we can't lead people to where we're not. Yeah. I mean, just as simple as that, right? Our teams uh, always reflect the leader of the team. Always. Yeah. Not saying there's not ever an outlier story, but if a team is most emotionally healthy, the leader is emotionally healthy. Yeah. Right? Just holistically, it's just going to be there. If the team is passionate and courageous and committed, the leader is passionate, courageous, and committed, right? It's just, yeah. those things just always work work together. And that's why emotional health is so important for a leader to grasp that, that a leader's emotional health will reflect on the team. Either the team will be emotionally healthy or unhealthy, or people will be select, self-selecting out of that team because the leader, you know, isn't emotionally healthy. It, it's either way, but the team's all just, always reflect, always reflect the leader. And that's why it's important for leaders to go, well, I got to pay attention to my own emotional health because the desire is to lead people to emotional health. Like we can't make people be emotionally healthy, but to lead people to emotional health and set that bar of expectation, right? That like for me as a leader, my, my desire, my goal is to, to, to be emotionally healthy. But my goal and desire is for everyone on our, you know, Tri County Church team, to be emotionally healthy. And I'm just telling you, the people that are going to thrive in our organization are people who want to be emotionally healthy, and people who don't will self-select out. Yeah. Because well, we'll get into this more, but we will put the ownership. I will put the ownership of emotional health on the individual. I'm going yeah. to create the culture of expectation around emotional health. But ultimately, the ownership has to go in the Yeah, it's up to them. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that you say this emotionally healthy leadership. Um, this is going to make me seem so nerdy, but I just started to participate in this book club. One of my one of my friends is a, a launching pastor. They're planning a church in Columbus, and he got me and you know maybe four or five other guys that are pastors around the country, and we've been reading books together, and then just talking about them. And these are guys that are in my same season of life. Um, you know, recently married in the last couple of years. Some have kids. Um, some have kids on the way. And uh, it's just been interesting because we've been reading that book, Emotionally Healthy Leadership by Pete Scazzaro. Great book. And it is honestly, like, it's challenging, it's encouraging, it's wrecking me, but it's really making me start to face some of these issues and these questions that I have within myself in my leadership and how I want to be moving forward and how I want my teams to be and how I want, you know, my team members to be. It's just one of those things, like, it's been an awesome uh, journey for me, but then also to have this conversation on top of that, I just know it's just going to add layers um, upon that as well. It's just, it's really, uh, again, just such a timely conversation. Well, and I would say, you know, that's an incredible book. Um, his Emotionally Healthy Spirituality is another, he has a whole series of yeah. them. And we'll put all of these books in the sh show notes. So if you uh, um, are trying to remember what books, and as we talk through, there's a list of resources we're going to give you. Uh, just make sure you you um, sign up for the show notes and uh, you can go to advancingleader.com and uh, slash podcast and you can get them all there. And, uh, but incredible book, especially yeah. if your pursuit is to live a life of emotional health. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about just this concept of emotional intelligence. Um, you know, I know this, this phrase gets thrown out a lot. I think it's something that's becoming, you know, if it wasn't already really prominent, I think it's becoming even more so, um, in the, in the business world and leadership in, in the corporate world, just all over the place, but just knowing yourself, knowing your emotions and responding to them, but also being able to recognize the emotions of other people and, and how your, your emotions can actually impact them. Like, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about that in leadership as well? Yeah. There's a guy named Daniel Goldman. He wrote a book, a book that's literally titled emotional intelligence. And so many times in, in leadership, you know, we look at people's competency, or you could, you know, say their IQ, right? Yeah. Their intelligence. How how gifted are they? And uh, and competency uh, IQ is important. But what what people are discovering in, in leadership is that emotional intelligence is actually more important than IQ. 
there's a lot of highly gifted, highly competent individuals that have very low emotional intelligence and they burn out, they they blow up teams, they can't work well with people, right? You would rather take less competency but greater EQ hmm. uh, and and teach someone how to do a job or teach them how to yeah. become more skilled. But if they have the EQ, that's going to be team leadership, you know, both on the macro level, but even in the micro level, like team leadership, their, their EQ is always going to be a better forward movement within the church, the company, the organization, whatever it is, than just competency. And Daniel Goldman, he said this, if you are tuned out of your own emotions, you will be poor at reading them in other people. Mm. And that just really, it's such a simple statement, but it just sets, well, it just sets the trajectory. Leaders, great leaders, healthy leaders, they have to be tuned into their emotions because if they're not, they're not going to be tuned into their their team's emotions. And if they're not tuned into their team's emotion, their team is going to implode. Yeah. This is going to happen. This is a matter of time. And that's why leaders must, must be in tune to their emotions, their EQ. The more they're focused on themselves, the better leader they will be. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you think about if you are not recognizing your own emotions, then you're you're not going to know how that's affecting someone else. You're going to yeah. have no idea because you're not even picking up on it. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned this like IQ um, being great, but EQ being an even better indicator of if someone will be a good leader, a good fit in your team, a good person in your company. It's interesting. I was doing some research on just different personality types and in the Myers-Briggs, they have the different personalities, which are based off of, you know, introversion and extroversion, sensing and feeling, um, or thinking and feeling, sensing and, ob and observing or intuitive, and then judging and perceiving. And they actually have um, you know, some graphs of this is the ideal, and this is what's actually happening in like the workplace. So like a lot of people I think that have a higher IQ, that's kind of what's being looked after and sought after. Mm. But then those people with EQ, they might not show up or register as much on those uh, in an interview or, you know, if, if you're accepting applicants into a position. It's interesting you say that because it's almost like we have this huge imbalance in people in leadership sometimes, you know, depending on the context, but it's like, this is what people look after, but this emotional piece is something that if you, if you don't take it into consideration, it could have really, really bad impact down the road. Well, and it, and it does, not only does it impact you know, the overall organization, where the impact is felt directly, now indirectly the impact on the, the overall organization, but right within the team. And I have led staff with high IQ, great competencies, but their EQ was so off. Mm. And I just tell you, every day, every day, I will take lower IQ and high EQ on a staff member any day because you can teach, you can coach, you can come by side, yeah. you can send them to, to, to seminars, you can get them online. Like you can coach the competency side. Yeah. If their EQ is high, I tell you, the health of the entire team now, because if you get someone on the team, and we've had pe people with low EQ on the team, it, it, it drives everyone's productivity down hmm. because now they're dealing with that person and trying to navigate through with that person and trying to help lead through that person and one person with, with a, a low EQ. It, it just, it, it will crush the team. So let me ask you this without, you know, going too far in this direction, because I know we have a lot that we want to talk about today when it comes to our emotional um, health, but do you think that EQ can also be learned or, or developed? Great question. I do, I do believe it can. Yeah. But the amount of intentional effort and energy and courageous self-leadership it takes to focus hmm. that deeply on you to overcome what, whatever shortcomings of your emotional quotient that you're dealing with. Again, I think you can absolutely just and, a lot of and and you know, we'll talk about right towards the end that last that step that we're going to look at that God is a God that heals. Hmm. But it's easy to learn a skill, yeah, and get better at it. But when you have to stare at yourself and where you are severely falling short emotionally, hmm. 
I just, I find most people don't want to. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that's true. Yeah, so we, we've been in this uh, series, Jumpstart at Tri-County, and we've been talking about, you know, these different components of our health, our physical health, are we taking care of our bodies? Are we loving God with the gift of our bodies? Our mental health, like what are our thoughts like? Um, what is our mental health like? And, and are we pursuing God with our thoughts as well? And then this, this third piece, which is emotional health. You know, are we, are we taking care of emotional health? And, and you shared this phrase. I just think it's so good. It's you follow you everywhere you go. Yeah, I've said it over and over again throughout this entire Jumpstart series. And uh, it's it's interesting because I'm hearing people say it. And it, it's pithy and it's memorable and it's true. Mm. Right. You know, people leave job after job after job and they always blame the boss. They always blame the company and they never stop once to go, oh, wait, it's the same pattern. And I'm the constant... Throughout the pattern, yeah, you know, it's the same same reason, right? People get divorced the first time, and usually divorce is about the other person. That person didn't, they didn't show up, they didn't provide, they weren't there for me, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, mm. and that's the first divorce. But when you look at divorce percentages from the first divorce to the second divorce to the third divorce, right? They just skyrocket. Wow. Right? Why? Because that individual follows himself into second marriage, the third marriage, the fourth marriage, and they keep on blaming, well, yeah, I just, I just, I rebounded from my first marriage that didn't work to my second one. What about the third one, hmm. right? You're following yourself all along the way. And something within us as human beings, we want to fix everyone else, but we don't want to stare at ourselves. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, I can't change you. Hmm. Can't. Yeah. You can't change me. Right, you're married. You can't change your wife. I can't change my wife. Mm -hmm. What I can do is focus on me and becoming the the healthiest version of me possible. Yeah, that's what I can do. What I what I bring into my family, to my marriage, as a dad, as a leader, as a boss, is I have to bring the healthiest version of me possible. That's the greatest gift I give to my family, my marriage, my kids, uh, the staff that I get to to serve and lead is the healthiest version of me. It's all I can do. Yeah. Yeah, you can't outrun who you are. Uh, it's just one of those problems you can't outrun. You got to look at directly, which again, <laughs> really, really challenging. But yeah. So we have this framework that we talked about and uh, it's just this acronym PATH. So the first one is PAUSE. The second is admit, the third is talk, and the last one is heal. And each of these different components have an explanation and an action step. Um, but I would love to start with this first one. This first step on, on path to emotional health is pause. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, pause is, is I think, the first kind of step of pause is just the word intentionality. Yeah. You have to be intentional with your emotions. Again, it's so easy to be intentional on a skill set. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work on my communication skill, or I'm gonna work on, you know, my technology skill. I'm gonna work on whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna work on, right? It's so easy on a competency side to be intentional. But when it comes to emotional health, it just gets overlooked every time. And pause is saying, I am going to intentionally choose to pause the crazy rhythm of my life to focus on my emotional health. And it's just, it's making the statement. And that's why, that's why, you know, the first step on the path to emotional health is saying, I'm going to pause and I'm going to be intentional with the rhythm of my life that I care that much about my emotional health, that I'm going to find the right rhythm. It's not about balance. It's about rhythm, mm. the right rhythm so that I can pay attention to where I am emotionally and what I need to do. Again, I follow me wherever I go, right? What I need to do as a leader to, to stare at my emo, uh, own uh, uh, emotional health. And then once you, once you realize, yeah, that has to be intentional, then the next part of that pause is it's about intentionally carving out time. Hmm. Right, it's a it's a two action si side. Yeah, I, I'm going to choose to be intentional to be the the healthiest version of me possible when it comes to my emotions. I'm yeah. going to choose that. Right, so I'm I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to figure out the right rhythm. And once I have that commitment to myself, now I'm going to intentionally carve out time. Right, which you want to slide them all together. Mm -hmm. 
But so many times people are like, yeah, I'm going to be intentional and carve out time, but time is precious. Yeah. And I haven't actually made the determination if I actually want to be intentional with my feelings. Hmm. So it's a choice of saying, I'm going to be intentional with my feelings. I'm going to be intentional with my emotional health, Yeah. period. Now, because of that, I'm going to carve out time. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because it is so much easier to work on a competency, competency than it is your emotions. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll spend time researching. I'll spend time learning something. I'll spend time working on something. But then when it comes to your emotions, it's like, well, that's going to take time. That, that's going to be hard. That's going to be uncomfortable. So that's it. You said one thing that I just want to um, talk about a little bit more. You said it's not about balance. It's about rhythm. Mm. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? I think that concept is so big in this conversation and many others when it comes to leadership and life in general. It's like we're all looking for balance, but that's exhausting. What is, what is the difference between balance and rhythm? Yeah, the word exhausting is that so many times people try to, to achieve balance. And, and again, you could you know, apply it to time management, uh, but we're applying this to our m emotional health. Mm -hmm. And you try to achieve balance, and there's so much energy just trying to stay balanced. Yeah. And that's just never achievable. You're just never going to. And so the rhythm is a word that there's different speeds. You know, I talk about sixth gear and first gear, right? Yeah. There's just different speeds. And you're, you know, with emotional health, you're going to be intentional to go, hey, in this season or this week or this day, I'm going to choose to crank up to sixth or I'm going to choose to crank down to first. Yeah. But what I realize is I have six gears and I should use all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at some right? point. At some point, right? It is It is good to use all of those different gears. I, I do a lot of road cycling and uh, right, you have more than six gears. And, and, and you're always being very intentional to say, hey, what gear am I in? What gear should I be in? I'm always reading the terrain and going, hey, there's a massive climb coming up. And what gear I choose to enter that climb, what gear that I choose um, to sustain that climb, right? There's a lot of mental energy going in and being very intentional because if you get in the wrong gear at the wrong climb at the wrong elevation i'm just telling you i've hit an elevation hmm. i got it wrong and i was in too big a gear and i'm i'm dying on the hill yeah and trying to change into a lower gear when the elevation is at 10 11 12 percent i mean it's it's you can do it but it's a challenge <laughs> it's a thing yeah and the same thing going downhill right you're like you're always and i think that's the goal when it comes to, it's not balance, it's rhythm. It's going to, hey, I know that throughout my leadership life, I have to be adjusting my rhythm, especially when it comes to emotional health, mm -hmm. to realize that there's just times where I can crank into a higher gear. There's times I must intentionally, intentionally force myself into a lower gear yeah. so I can focus on, on, on me, fill back up, and I know what's coming my way and I'm going to crank back into a gear. I, we just came through a Christmas season. Yeah. And very intentionally, we shut down for two weekends after Christmas. We had online church, but not physical campuses. And I told everyone, yeah. hey, you you have 10 days. You, you better leverage that time for you. Hmm. Why? Because January is starting. We're rushing into Easter. Yeah, we're going right? to get into another gear. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's such a key insight. That's a gold nugget, honestly. Like third gear all the time is actually worse than switching between first and sixth. Like yeah. if you're constantly going at like, you know, we'll say a, a moderate pace, it's actually worse over time. It's not sustainable over time. It'll, you know, something will happen down the road where you need to shift into another gear. And if you're in third all the time, you're not going to have the energy to go up a gear or uh, you, you know, you're going to want to rest too often after. So that's that's a really big insight. So we have action steps for this first one. What does it look like to pause? It is so simple. You got to schedule time. You, you have to, as a leader, schedule time for you, mm. period. If you don't schedule time for you, everyone else will, will cannibalize your calendar. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest dangers of a leader because a leader wants to serve their team. They want to be available for their team. They want to show up and encourage their team, right? They're always focused on other people. Good leaders are focused on other people. Mm -hmm. But that also means they got to focus on themselves because you're people and I'm a people, mm -hmm. right? And so my 
choice to say, in rhythm, there's going to be rhythm that I'm focused on everyone else, Mm -hmm. but there's a rhythm that focuses on me so that I can focus on everyone else. Yeah. And you just got to, you got to schedule time. You know, one, one of the ways I've really failed in this and I'm getting better because I'm actively paying attention is uh, I record the message now on every, every Wednesday I record the message. And, uh, but it doesn't matter what day I give the message. I've been really bad at this. I will know I need a day blocked out on the message and I will, I'll stack meetings. I'll take phone calls. I will answer messages and now I'm running behind on the message, hmm. and uh, which doesn't serve anyone, let alone me. Yeah. And so now I'm just very selfish with my message writing time. I'm very selfish. I turn off my phone. I'm not on messages. I don't schedule meetings. Sorry. Yeah. I, so, so now my rhythm is Wednesdays are completely blocked out. Yeah. No one gets access to me because I got to deliver at 2 2 p.m. That means I need all of that time leading up to finalize that message. And I just don't. I'm very selfish. It's scheduled. Hmm. No one else gets that time. We're taking a week next week, all staff. We're canceled all the meetings. Said, hey, this is a gift to all of you as staff. It's still a work week. Yeah. But now we're going to crank the, the gear down from sixth maybe to second or maybe to fourth, whatever mm. year, we're going to crank it down. You focus on your projects that you need to get moving forward. And now you have extra time because we've canceled every meeting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to do it myself. I got to get ahead of some, some massive projects. I already have my week blocked out on my calendar. It's intentional. Yeah. You got to intentionally schedule time. Yeah. And I think, you know, this just this concept that like, Again, our teams are going to look like us. Our teams are going to lead like us. So for for me and my team, like I have to model that for them to understand the culture and what they need to do personally. You you do the same thing with yeah. our team. You got to model it so that we can follow your lead in taking care of our emotions. Yeah. So you know, one thing that I was talking with my team, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, was just the same thing. Like, hey, schedule some time for yourself. Put it on your Google Calendar. If it's half an hour, if it's an hour, and if someone says, "Can I grab you for a meeting? Can you take a phone call?" Tell them no. Yeah. Even if all it is is you're sitting in the dark of your office for 10 minutes with your eyes closed, take that time for yourself. And, you know, I need to be better at this. I've been trying to actually put something on my calendar. Say, you know, this is my time where I need to to pour back into myself, where I need to spend time with God because my capacity completely diminishes if I'm not spending that time with God. So, yeah, just like carve out that time, uh, put it on a schedule, on a schedule, put it on a calendar Make sure it's there, and then and don't don't move it. Don't yeah. move it for anything. And don't feel bad. Yeah, I still I still feel bad when I schedule stuff for me, and someone goes, "Hey, Chris, can I talk to you at mm. time day?" And it's like I have every Wednesday message blocked out. I still feel bad. Yeah, I feel bad mm-hmm. because as a leader, I want to be available for people. Yeah, I want to be there for them. I want to, and I still feel bad. And then I have to talk myself out of feeling bad. I'm like, Chris, you, you got you got to. You you got to. for sustainable rhythm, you have to be selfish with blocks of your time. Yeah. Okay, so we're pausing. What's next? Next one. A is admit. Admit. And this is all about ownership. Goes back to you follow you wherever you go. Hmm. And and it it is such a diff I think this might be one of the most difficult steps of the entire emotional path, yeah. right? Uh, pausing is difficult, but admitting and taking ownership of your own uh, emotions, looking at yourself in the mirror and staring at yourself and actually intentionally desiring to see where you need to work on, what areas you need to work on. I just think this is why most people burn out and, uh, stop leaving hmm. is they just refuse or don't want to uh, because they start to look at themselves and they just don't want to see what they see. Wow. Yeah, that's huge. And I think, you know, this reminds me of something that you talked about in another podcast we did, just that own hundred percent of what you need to own. And I think this is a applicable, applicable here, you know, like this applies right mm-hmm. here. You have to own your percentage and it's up to us to admit to ourselves what's really going on. Yeah. So Part of our emotions and feelings gets tethered into our personalities. Mm. 
and knowing your personality and know what fill, fills you up emotionally, what drains you emotionally. Yeah. And, and, and that, again, it could be a crutch, right? So I'm not saying allow it to be a crutch, but it is understanding. So what, what I know about me is, is that uh, being alone is what fills me up. Mm-hmm. But my job is about being with people all the time. Yeah. All the time. And, and I, I love pouring myself into people. Right, it's not you know. So many times people feel like it's one or the other. No, I love being around people and pouring myself into people, but it also drains me. Just because it drains me doesn't mean I don't love it. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't be in church leadership if I didn't want to pour into people. Yeah, it still drains me, and for me to admit that piece about me, it, it's a step to freedom because now I have to go. Okay, Chris, it, it's going to take you extra leader self leadership to realize that what you love is pouring into people but just because you love pouring into people your personality is such that it's going to drain you faster now you have to figure out how to pour back into yourself if not you're going to be running on empty yeah i think knowing yourself is such a big a big part of this um you know and i know we talked about this conversation before but self awareness is great but if it's too focused on self then it becomes become self-absorption, and then it actually doesn't serve the purpose that you're looking to. You know, it's great to say, I'm going to take care of myself so I can take care of other people. But if you're only focused on taking care of yourself, you will neglect other people. Well, and there again comes the rhythm. Yeah. Right? Mm. That's the rhythm. There's a healthy side of self-awareness where you focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. If you never then actually start focusing on other people again, it always ends with self-absorption. Yeah. But I think so many leaders fear that they'll become self-absorbed. Mm. Well, they actually then stop looking at themselves at all. Mm. And it's not healthy for the team that they leave because lead because people are watching them how they lead themselves. Yeah. And then they have blind spots they're not yeah. seeing. Everyone. Yeah, I think it's interesting because we have all these examples of seasons. Like even just think about Pennsylvania. We have every season imaginable and sometimes they overlap and sometimes you have all seasons in one day. Right. Um, but it's an example of this is how life operates as well. Like we're no different. We have seasons. And I think that's just something important to, you know, look at when we're when we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at our leadership, there will be seasons of intense self-reflection where we have to admit it. We have to look at it. Then there's going to be other seasons where we're fuller. We have filled ourselves back up and we need to focus on other people and journey with them as they try to figure this out. So Yeah, when, when, when you think about self-awareness, there's a whole list of questions that I think are just important to keep in front. Just keep in front. And this is an exhaustive list, but it I think it's an important list. It's... You know, are you aware of your your own emotional state? Mm-hmm. Where are you now? That's admitting. Uh, the next question: Do you recognize how your behavior impacts other? Mm-hmm. Right, and behavior is fueled by your emotional health or yeah. lack thereof. Yeah. It always does. Are you uh, paying attention to how others influence your emotional state and how quickly they can influence your emotional state. Because if you're in a state of emotion, emotional health, right, you're filled up, well, it's going to take a lot more for someone to impact your emotional state. Mm-hmm. But if you're on empty... Yeah, it's quick. Right? One person, one look, one comment, one voice inflection sets you, sets you off. Yeah. Right? Okay, um, so it's really hard to admit, but how do we start to do that? Well, I think I think one one of the steps of you know the the how uh, to do that is you have to personally sit down and uh, and I'm not a huge like journaling person, mm-hmm. but you got you got to get your thoughts out. Yeah, you got to write it down. You have to write it down. Yeah, because when you get your feelings, your emotions out into open space, open air into black and white, mm-hmm. you know, unless you're using a purple pen, so purple and white. Mm. Right? When you actually get those emotions, those feelings out, that's where you can start paying attention to them. Okay. And I just think it has to, you know, if uh, all the health experts, they talk about if you want to lose weight, you got to keep a food diary or a food journal or an exercise j- journal. Yeah. You know, three, four weeks ago, I really cranked down into my physical health. Yeah. I was really convicted and... Uh, I start. I have this entire. It's very complicated, but it's a whole um, Google Sheet uh, document. There's multiple pages, but I'm. 
I mean, every Monday away myself, I'm writing down all my exercise and what I'm doing. I have an exercise plan that's getting recorded. Everything is in multiple pages. They all link to, it's a thing. Yeah. But I tell you, I'm staring at it. Yeah. I, I can't lie to myself. Yeah. The I, no, yeah. And the stuff that's on the sheet, that's not, you can't change that. Yeah. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm exercising every day. And then you go, well, that week was four. Mm-hmm. That's not every day. And yeah. I'm not saying you should even exercise every day, but right, it's so easy to deceive yourself. Yeah. And we are experts at deceiving. Oh, I, I eat healthy most of the week. And then you go, did you? Yeah. Well, yeah, except for that business lunch and except for that breakfast and except that late night and except yeah. all of a sudden you're like, no, you didn't eat healthy at all. Yeah. And, and that's why the how is so important. You have to schedule time. You have to sit down and you got to start writing. What, what are you feeling? Mm-hmm. And start thinking, well, why are you feeling that way? Yeah. What emotions are really there? Yeah. What emotions are on the surface? And what emotions are tucked behind the surface? Yeah. What emotions are in the shadows? Yeah, I think you and I are wired similarly when it comes to, you know, writing things down. Like I, I'm the same way. I have to have a workout plan. I have to have, I have to write things down. I have to keep track of it. Um, you know, if I don't do those things, I'm off the rails. Uh, and then when it comes to to my emotions, you know, I'm not always great at even identifying what I'm feeling. So if I don't write it down, I have no idea. Like my wife, she knows herself super well and her emotions, and she picks up on what I'm feeling way before I do. And then like, I finally get to that point and she's like, thank you. Like, I've been waiting for you to realize this is what you're feeling, but I just think it's such a powerful tool to write something down. Um, and, and I know if you're like me, maybe you don't have the ability to identify an emotion right away. So like this tool could make the difference in admitting what you're actually feeling. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what sets you off? What makes you feel insecure? Mm-hmm. What, what uh, ha- gets you angry really quickly? Yeah. What comment uh, in a leadership team conversation uh, did, did someone make or a question someone asked you that sent you emotionally uh, spinning? Yeah. You know, I shared with you, you know, there's two instances this week. Great questions, but emotionally they hit me. Mm-hmm. And uh and I actually went to both people and just asked the question. Yeah. And that is right, that is it was, hey, I heard this question. I want to get more clarity. And in the conversation, I was able to say, yeah, this is what I felt, but I knew that wasn't right. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm going to ask you. And it got so much clarity. But it was me, you know, talking out loud with someone, right? Which is another step, yeah. right? Talking out loud to someone going, hey, this is what I was processing. This is what I was hearing. This is what I was feeling. And there was a feeling on one conversation. I didn't even realize I was feeling until the other person made a statement. I'm like, oh, that was there mm. within me. Yeah. Where did that come from? It forces me to pay attention to those emotions, again, leak, uh, 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 kind of seeping into the shadows, mm. but they always creep up yeah. and they always impact leadership, always. Yeah, so I mean, you just did it perfectly. That's the next step that we're about to just get into. It's T, it's talk, talk to someone. Um, why don't we just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there, there's two different gr- groups of people that, that I think are important in this conversation. One is a trusted mentor, someone who you respect spiritually, someone who you respect as a leader, mm-hmm. someone who you respect how they handle their emotions, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> like It's important to find those people. And then count a counselor. And I think there's a huge need for both sets of people in your life. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. You know, you know, a counselor is someone who is completely personally disconnected from you that has such a, a great vantage point into well what you're processing with them. Yeah. And I know I know you're a huge proponent of counseling. I'm a huge proponent of counseling. Yeah. We talk about that out loud a lot to the teams we lead. We're like, yeah. hey, counseling is a great, great tool to help you navigate through your well, your EQ, your emotional quotient, your emotional health. And so but it's finding those people and having those people in your life that that you will go to and you will process with. Yeah. Yeah, we need people to encourage us. We need people to challenge us. We need people to walk with us. We need that accountability, like you said. Um, so what's the action step here? Got to meet with someone. Yeah. 
schedule something with yeah. with someone. Right. So so we go back to the very first step about pausing, right? It's intentionally scheduling time. Yeah. And it's intentionally scheduling time for you to sit down, write out your emotions, write out what you're feeling, paying attention to yourself, and it's scheduling time intentionally that you can process with someone. You know, we're we're in it. Right. There's a formality to counseling where you have a counseling set. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I was sharing with you before this podcast is it's on my sh- sh- uh, my longer, short, shorter list, mm-hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like it's not immediate, but it's going to happen sometime in, in 2021 where I'm looking for a counselor outside of the immediate area. So that's why I'm going to have to figure out how to drive there. But at least once a month just to go as a maintenance for mm-hmm. me. Just a process. Yeah. Just and have it on my calendar where once a month I know I can check in. Yeah. And then I have a couple really close people to me now where I can just talk to. They're just friends. And I can just say something out loud. I said something. And, and my wife is is a voice into my emotional health. She's not the only voice. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. She's not the only person, but I said something so stupid uh, last week. I got real frustrated something. I'm like, I'm just done with, and it was something very specific. I'm done with it. She just looked at me, and she kind of laughed. She goes, no, you're not. <laughs> gotta love it. You gotta love it. No, you're not. Yeah. And, I, and I, I was like, yes, I'm, you're right. You're I'm right. not. By the next day, I was back on fire, yeah. moving it forward. I'm like, let's go. But in that moment, I just needed her to say, mm, no, you're not. Yeah. Because I was just, I was talking out of just anger. I was talking out of frustration. I was talking out of some emotional in- unhealth and some things tethered to it. And her just saying, no, you're not, just got me out of that funk. Mm-hmm. It just woke me up. And uh, I was like, yeah, Chris, you're being an idiot. <laughs> Why are you even saying that? Because you know you're not. Yeah. Next morning, I was back at it. Yeah. So I think leaders, there's two steps really in this one. You know, I think the first is, you know, not just to carve out this time. That's like the overall broader picture, but find a trusted mentor, find somebody that maybe is a little bit further in their journey of, of leadership, of life, whatever that context looks like, find that person, ask them to lunch, ask them for a zoom call, ask them out to coffee and just see, you know, what insights you can glean from them. And then if this is something that you need to do, which again, I'm a huge proponent for going to counseling, going to somebody as a third party who's objective, who can help you kind of see um, something maybe you haven't. Pick pick a time, go see a counselor. Um, it's something that I think there's this idea that, oh, only people that are really in deep water go to counseling. Yeah. But you said it, it's a maintenance thing. It's a preventative measure. It's something healthy that we can do to make sure we don't get into deeper water down the road. So... So many people wait until it, it's, 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 and I pause, it's never too late. Yeah. But they wait until one step before too late. Yeah. And then everything's crumbling around them and they wonder how they got there. It's like, well, you should, you should have thought about this a year ago or two years ago, or you should have paid attention way before you get to this place yeah again it's never too late it's never too late but the climb out so much more difficult mm. so much more difficult and that's why counseling a trusted mentor having people to talk to to help process process with you will help keep you you know in alignment you know point one degree off of alignment well by the time you're a mile down the road you're way out of alignment oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. counseling and talking with a trusted mentor just keeps you aligned. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is the last component of path, the H, which is heal. Uh, I think, you know, we've talked about this going into this conversation. This one's so important. might be the most important part of this framework. And, uh, I would just love to, you know, to really dive into this conversation, but maybe to take a, a moment just to, you know, really figure out what this one is all about. I think P, A, and T really depend on us, right? Yeah. We have to pause. We have to choose that. We have to admit we have to choose that. We have to talk to someone. We have to choose that. This last one, it's bigger than us. Yeah. God is a God of healing. God knows we're broken, fractured people. And we're going to be broken, fractured people in our time here on this earth. We just are. Yeah. Right? There's a battle going on. We talked about this in, in part three of Jumpstart on Our Mind. And uh, Ben Clark, who gave the message, he... he he made the statement that our mind is a meeting space between God, the spirit and our sinful nature. Mm. 
And I love how he just said that because that that is, that's that's the space where they come together. God the Spirit who's guiding, leading us in our sinful nature. And our sinful nature is not going to stop on this on this earth. Not going to. Yeah. One day when we're in Jesus, that's when we're going to be made whole. Yeah. But we're not going to. And in that statement, it's not saying it's an excuse to say, oh, we don't have to work on ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. We... Our pursuit is to live a life that reflects Jesus in the best way we can. Yeah. And that's the pursuit. Not just to say, oh, I'm a I'm a sin I'm a sinner. Oh well, I'm just gonna do no 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 no. Yeah. Right. God the Spirit has promised us his, his power, his strength, his guidance in our life right now on this earth. Mm. And God is a God that heals. And I love the story about uh, Jesus healing uh, the widow from Nain, this l- little uh, obsolete town that was way out of the way that no one ever chose to go to. And I love the story because, well, Luke, who who was retelling the story, he gives such powerful details into the story. I mean, this massive crowd of people was leaving Nain because it was a funeral procession and Jesus was walking toward... Jesus chose to go to this town. Hmm. He had just taught, you know, the longest recorded message, Sermon on the Mount, crowd of people is following Jesus, and he chooses to go. I mean, you had to imagine all these people are like, where are we going? <laughs> and as they approached Nain, why Nain? Yeah. But Jesus knew. And so you have two massive crowds of people converging together, and uh, Luke writes that Jesus saw her. Saw her. Jesus, surrounded by people and commotion and distraction, and this massive group of people coming out of town, you know, filled with commotion and distraction. I mean, they were weeping and wailing, mm-hmm. like all of this. And Jesus looked through it on, saw her, and then Luke, trying to find the strongest word to actually describe what took place, so that Jesus had compassion for her. And the little tra- literal translation is, he felt with all of his bowels. <laughs> right? Like what a. What a gross picture. Yeah. <laughs> but you could tell Luke was just like, as he heard the story from eyewitnesses, he was trying to grab that Greek word that would just say, like, everything from within Jesus felt for her. Yeah. And then he went up and spoke to her. And on the surface, it, it feels kind of uh, insensitive because he said, don't cry. Mm. But what Jesus knew is what was going to come next. Yeah. And so he was trying to calm her tears and then he walks up to the the wooden stretcher that the the dead boy was laying on and he touched it and healed the boy. Wow. And I think about all of that. And that's just how God sees us. Like God God sees us through the crowd, through yeah. the distraction, through the commotion. He sees what we're going through. Hmm. He just like he saw the widow, he sees us with all of his I'm going to say it again, bowels, because mm-hmm. it's such a great word. Right? <laughs> he has compassion. His heart goes out for us. He aches for us. Yeah. He speaks directly to us. And God is a God who heals. Maybe not in the way we expect him to heal. This, this widow did not expect that to happen that day. Yeah. She didn't wake up going, well, today, yeah, everyone thinks we're going to bury my son. But Jesus, she did not expect that. Yeah. But Jesus healed him. And, and Jesus heals, again, maybe not in ways we expect him, but he will heal. And we have to just lean into God's healing strength, his healing power when it comes to our own broken and fractured lives. Yeah. I think, you know, something you and I have talked about on this topic is just the, pr- the process, the journey. Healing is a, is a process. And, I, and I've told, told you guys this before. I'm very outcome driven. Mm. I'm very focused on the outcome. Sometimes I will get to the outcome as quickly as possible, which is not a good thing. When healing happens, it doesn't happen that way. It happens inside of the process, not at the outcome. Um, and you know, we were just talking about this. We're always going to be dealing with something that we need to heal from. As soon as we heal from one thing, we're on to the next thing. Like it's just never ending. And I think that's why this step is so important because if it was left to our own strength to heal ourselves, we would have nothing left on this step alone. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to heal the first thing, let alone the next 10 that are coming. We need to rely on Jesus because the reality is life is going to be hard. We're going to pick up scars. We're going to pick up wounds. Uh, but if we don't come to Jesus for that healing, we try to deal with it ourselves. We're just going to be left with open wounds, open scars. Um, and I just think this step, really just surrendering to Jesus and trusting that his way of healing is better. His process, his journey is better for us is, uh, is the aha. So, so what are some action steps when it comes to healing? 
I think a couple is I've thought about, you know, what what's needed to heal. I think one is just forgiveness. Oh, yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, deep emotional wo- wounds in people's lives from childhood, from just the course of time where mm-hmm. people have not truly forgiven. And uh, if you don't forgive, bitterness grows. Yep. And bitterness keeps wounds open. And I think that's why, you know, leaning into to Jesus to help you, the more the more we realize the extent of Jesus's forgiveness, you know, for I'll personalize it for Chris Trothaway, how he continues to forgive me. I mean, that's just mind blowing. Yeah. Well, it it moves me to be able to extend forgiveness to people I don't want to forgive. Yeah. <laughs> because there's people I don't want to forgive. But the more I focus on Jesus's constant forgiveness to me, it just it just does. It, yeah. it it moves me to forgive. And forgiveness, I think, is one of those incredible healing pieces that as we actually forgive, like God has forgiven us, that starts to, well, it gets rid of bitterness and starts to allow healing to 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 take to take place. Wow. I think another one is well not just forgiving other people, it's forgiving myself. That's a big one. Like I've made stupid decisions. I've made emotionally reactionary decisions. I've made decisions that I'm ashamed of. But I'm human. And there's just times where you just like Chris, you just gotta give yourself grace. Yeah. Right? Like I, I'm a pastor. And that's a horrible title anyway. I hate it. You know, I, everyone, I hate the title. Mm-hmm. I'm a Christ follower that, that God has called me to lead in the church. Yeah. I like that much better. It doesn't fit on a business card, but I <laughs> like it. But it's like, I feel this way of being super husband, super dad, super... And I've just continued to come back to say, Chris, you, you have to give yourself... You got to forgive yourself because you're setting a standard you'll never reach. And honestly, God doesn't expect me to reach it. Yeah. And my kids don't expect me to reach it. My wife doesn't. They know I'm all too human. Yeah. And so forgiving self is so important to say, yeah, I, I am imperfect. But my pursuit is to live the healthiest life I can, understanding that God loves me, his grace is sufficient for me, and he forgives me. Yeah. Well, Chris, I just want to thank you for this conversation. I, I think, again, so important. Uh, helpful for me. I know to be helpful for our leaders as well. Uh, just to, just to recap guys, pause, schedule time, be intentional, admit, write it down, speak it out, talk, talk with someone you trust, someone who's wise, maybe a mentor or even a counselor. And the last one is heal, seek healing that's sourced from Jesus that comes from Jesus. Seriously, Chris, um, just thankful for your thoughts. Thankful for this conversation. Well, I think for you and I both, this entire series jumpstart has been very timely. Yeah. But personally, as leaders, as just two guys, mm-hmm. I know we've had so many offline conversations just about how God is growing and stretching us in such really cool ways. And I, that's why I love why I love the conversation today is because we have so, we have so many more stories that we didn't even share share on this podcast. Yeah. Of just real life of what we're going through, and I I think that. There's so much healing that comes from just, well, these four steps, pausing, admitting, talking. Well, healing comes from doing that. Mm -hmm. And so we just want to encourage all of you, jump on the path and realize that God doesn't expect you to be perfect, uh, but God is perfect. And what he can do in and through you can change lives. Well, all the resources we've talked about are in the show notes. Go to advancingleader.com slash podcast, and uh, you can sign up for those and get those sent directly to you. And, well, this has been another Advancing Leader Podcast.